Good morning, everyone. Let me add my personal welcome to that of Steve's. I'm so sorry I can't be with you this morning, but I'm flying the flag for experts in USA, in New York, and in Dallas. But I know you're going to have a fantastic morning with a great speaker, a company that's doing amazingly innovative things. I hope you will hit your first calendar year's quarter's targets. If you haven't, here are some thoughts you might like to think about. Number one, make sure you hit your top five. What do I mean by that? The top five outcomes that you have to have to make sure that your business hits its targets by the end of the year. The focus you have on that and the ability of the brain to strip out distractions will help you on your way. Number two, you might want to think now of your top ten, your top ten thinner goals which support your big five. These thinner goals will make sure that your top five are supported and again, you'll have a better opportunity of hitting it. Number three, revisit your values. What are your top five values? And are you behaving with authenticity to these values? These values give you the ability to fly and acting out of sync with your values will not optimize your opportunities. Number four, give up the to-do list. Airless players don't have to-do lists. If anything, and if they have any list, it will be a letting go list. Letting go of the things which are not critical to your top five, to your big ten, to your values. Focus on the things which only need to be done to support your top five and your big ten. Um, and lastly, um, look at your behaviors in terms of the daily rituals. Screen out all those which don't support your big five and your top ten because that way the mind will focus and strip out distractions that and noise level which get in the way of what we want to achieve. So the best of luck with quarters two, three and four. Have a wonderful morning. I so look forward to seeing the video of the presentation today because I know you're really going to enjoy it. Have a great day. Thanks, Eric. Um, these mornings, these presentations only happen because of one person, and that's Gary Hankston. Uh, Gary's one of the partners here at BDO. He runs the Cambridge office, so looks after all their tech stuff, and he also looks after all of the American offices. He's the liaising partner with their uh, American offices, and a big Chelsea fan. And like me as an Arsenal fan, and Sam's a Bolton fan, and all those are suffering, but delighting in Leicester about to win the league. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Hanson. <laughs> so normally at these I've got my own PR man, because um, Eric stands up as part of his introduction and says to everyone in the room, if you haven't got BDO as your trusted advisors already, um, go and talk to Gary as part of the networking today because um, B he uses BDO a lot across the world uh, and uh, he recommends us highly and I was hoping he'd put it into his little five things to remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then I wouldn't have to say very much is it, but it's better if somebody else is doing your um, creds for you than yeah. doing your own. So I've been asked a few times at these events and this is the third one we've done here in the office at 55 Baker Street why BDO are interested in hosting an event like this and working uh, with entrepreneurs, investors, and very clever people like those of you in the room, all far better at what you do than I am, probably or would be at what you do. So the reason for it all sort of goes back to um, some of the people I know in this room, one of whom is Steve. Steve and I 
met the first time uh, nine years ago uh, when our children were working to, together to try and find their way in their first school, so senior school. Um, and Steve's been a dreamer, as those of you know him well, know that Steve is a dreamer, he's out there. And one thing he does do, um, which is something that I've tried to do and replicate, is network with as many people as possible, because you never quite know when you're going to be able to help someone to do something. And you know, BDO as an organisation is constantly out to help businesses grow and for people to thrive. It's part of the ethos that goes throughout the BDO network globally. So what we want is businesses like yours to grow, us to be your advisors and work with you to grow with you. Because if you grow on the back of help and advice and investment, uh, then it's beneficial for everybody. So Steve's networks with all sorts. And in the old days, at an event like this, you might invite some sellers and some buyers along. And you might be able to say to someone, you sell books, here's a, someone who um, buys books or produces books, and you might be able to put one person in touch with one person through an event like this. Listening to the people in this room, and similarly at the last two of these events that we've hosted, life's not like that anymore. With the digital age, everybody's talking to everybody all of the time, and the technology everywhere you look is changing all of the time. So unless you're mixing in an event and an environment like this, and hearing what is happening, then you're missing out on opportunities. And what Steve's done brilliantly is from talking to others around this room, is pull together what Jeannie Nett are doing, what Shazam are doing, far bigger companies than Steve's company or even BDO are doing in the global space and giving opportunities. Because um, even Shazam need help in getting to the next stage of their growth. No matter how big you are, the environment's changing, the technology's changing, and therefore the opportunities and the market are changing. And talking to Rick earlier about some of the ideas he's had to move publishing, uh, space ideas, just this experiential idea, something to somebody else earlier, about how more and more is done virtually, and actually getting experience and some excitement in our lives is going to become increasingly important. So zoos, like the park Steve helps run, is growing. They get popular, um, people going through it, because people actually want to see animals, it's all very well seen on television, on screens but you still want to experience it. Um, and we were talking about retail and where that's going to go, and that, that again is going to be pretty interesting. So just quickly about BDO. BDO is the fifth largest firm of uh, accountants, tax advisors, uh, and uh, general advisory consultants in the world. Um, in our space, uh, we've got 65,000 people in 154 countries in 1,400 offices. So there isn't much we can't do uh, anywhere in the world to help you. There aren't any countries that we go to, and I've helped a lot of the tech businesses from in and around Cambridge set up their businesses in the US from scratch. Um, one in particular had £100,000 sitting in uh, the App Store uh, in, uh, in California, and they couldn't get it out unless they got a bank account and the company set out to get there. So right from early stage stuff, we've helped right through to some of the bigger public companies across the space. The UK firm uh, has got revenues of 370 million. There are uh, 200 equity partners, and we've got 18 offices across the UK. Uh, and we do everything from tax, including transfer pricing, uh, advisory, uh, which includes so corporate finance, merger and acquisition activity, transaction services, as well as the basic audit and tax services. So that's why we host it and why we're here. Today, we've got the opportunity of welcoming Clay, who I'd like to say we wanted to make him stand out by not having a name badge that we prepared for him, because you would think the main speaker would have a proper name badge, at least, with flashing lights or something, <laughs> instead of which Clay's had to write his own. So, yeah. so there's bits easy to be the old technology. And there's one little bit of the story of Gimbal that, you know, you go on the website and you look at it, and it's quite a common story amongst a lot of the tech companies that I've come across up in Cambridge over the last nine years, and that is how many iterations you have to go through and how long it takes. Now, either the technology doesn't work, um, and we had that with Ginny a few times in terms of whether the technology is actually going to work. So part of it is when, whether the technology is actually going to work. Secondly, is if it is going to work, have you got enough money to get it to the point where it is working and you can take it out into the market? And then the third thing, which happens quite a lot in the Cambridge uh, tech community, 
is um, this is a brilliant idea, but nobody knows it yet. So it's actually getting the market to latch on and realise one that the product does what you say it does, and there's a need for it. Uh, and four, you can make some money out of having it. So when I looked at Gimbal online and went through the website and the history, it's six generations, so it proves there were five generations that had to be developed, and I'm sure that'd be part of Clay's story about how Gimbal got to where it got to. And it came in under the umbrella of Qualcomm originally, as part of the Qualcomm stable of products, um, and they, they ended up spinning out five years ago, wasn't it? Was it? Two. Two years ago. So it spun out of Qualcomm and it's in its sixth generation. So I'm really interested to hear, particularly having heard Sam's talk about Shazam last month, uh, about where Shazam was going and how it had evolved from you just texted in five digits and someone would come back to you and tell you in, in your text message um, what, the, uh, what the music you were listening to was uh, to be able to walk past the Ford Focus sitting at Lakeside and it would tell you you could go and have a test drive of this car because of the beacon because of Shazam and it all works like that. So without further ado, because I'm an accountant and Clay's an interesting technology <laughs> person, I'll pass over to Clay. Thanks. Morning everyone. Morning. Morning. Nice to Steve and Tina and, and Eric for, uh, for having me, of course. Uh, I, uh, I'm based in New York and I'm actually going to burn through this presentation because I, I find with a diverse group like this, it's best to just explain the basis of the technology and then let you guys fire away questions uh, that are, pertain to the areas that, that you work in. And as well, I'm gonna, uh, we've got a live demo, I think, uh, Sam is here again from Shazam, so we can show you those two <coughs> working together. Because uh, I have one without batteries. <laughs> All right. So, uh, as Gary said, we, we were uh, under the Qualcomm umbrella, and I'd be remiss if I didn't tell uh, with that introduction, a little bit of where this all started. And where it started was, um, and if you guys don't know Qualcomm, they produce chips for the majority of the world's handsets. And so you've got a lot of hardware engineers, a lot of software engineers doing a lot of different things. This project started within Qualcomm Labs, and it really was meant to track children. So amber alerts, things like that, you put beacons on children, you put beacons in buses, then you understand how they move about and you can kind of understand generally where they are to a micro location, maybe even in the classroom. They realized they can make a lot more money putting it into a retail environment, so it moved uh, these two separate hardware and software initiatives moved into Qualcomm retail solutions, and then they decided to spin it out about two years ago into, into Gimbal. So we're about 70 people down in San Diego, uh, got a four person office in New York, and we've got a, a few other satellite offices, both sales and development. Along here. And as I said, we, we span a lot of different uh, verticals. We did a lot in sports at the beginning. So we're in most major sports stadiums in the US. Uh, and basically, they're putting these devices around their, their, their stadiums. You have a mobile app that engages with, with those devices. I'll explain a little more about the technology. But you can see the different, as you think through the applications of micro proximity, we're a partner of Apple. We help develop the IDK protocol with them. So uh, we have some relationship with them in the US that I can't say a whole lot about. But if you go into an Apple store and you're engaged on your mobile phone when you get near something, that's probably our technology that's powering that. Uh, we do the same for festivals. So if you're in South by Southwest down in Austin, you're in a room with everybody else. It knows who else you're in the room with. And that's not because the phones are communicating to each other. There's a beacon in that room. There's a Bluetooth device. The phone sees that device, and then it also it communicates up to your phone communicates, excuse me, up to the server and says, "Here's where this person is," and therefore the phone knows that the other people are in that room. I'll, I'll get to a, a better example here, <laughs> but suffice it to say, we do a, a lot of things around location. We do geofencing, which we consider to be macro location, things above 50 meters. We use beacons for things below 50 meters, uh, and as well, we have. Uh, a set of tools to go into mobile apps. Our software at Mountain Kit is something that's inside of Shazam. It allows the, the app to see these Bluetooth devices. And then we have a platform to manage all of these things. So you can imagine if you're an advertising, at home advertising company, and you roll out 50,000 beacons, you need an easy way to manage them and know where they are and what batteries are low and things like that. So we have a whole portal, portal for that. But for these discussions, um, I just want to start by explaining 
the different types of location. The first would be, and this is used just as much as, as beacons. Beacons is a big buzzword, but geofencing has been around a while. And you can think of it this way. Your phone generally knows where you are. If you land at the airport, a lot of times what happens to me, I'll open Uber, and the app will put me into Hudson River, and it takes a minute to <laughs> recalibrate it right, and then put me actually at the airport. So it kind of knows that I'm at JFK Airport. It may know, it probably knows what terminal I'm in. Doesn't know what gate I'm at. Certainly doesn't know what side of the gate I'm sitting at. So uh, that's where beacons come in. But we have a whole geofencing solution here, whereby you literally these are based on lat longs in, in the system. But from a user standpoint, you can go in and you can draw literally on a map different points. We can actually do these polygonally, and that be becomes a geofence. So when your phone, which generally knows your location, crosses the plane of that geofence, then something can happen. Or maybe nothing happens, and it just logs that you were there. It just logs that you arrived at a shopping mall, and hey, isn't it interesting that you were at three shopping malls within the last month? Because whatever app you have knows that, right? And all these things are opt-in, right? So it's not like this is this is happening uh, uh, in, uh, without the user's permission. These are all opt-in things, and they happen through the mobile application. So so the apps are key to this. But that's macro location, geofencing. These are beacons. And actually, I brought a couple. So I'm going to pass these guys around, but this is our flagship device. It's, it's like an easy pass or size of a pack of playing cards. You're welcome to open it up. It's just four AA batteries that go into this thing. There's a little switch on it. There's some, a code, right? There's a, a, a code that lets our system know what this device is. So when it shows up somewhere else, we can register in our system. And Coming out of Qualcomm, we're, we're always on the edge of <coughs> technology, so uh, I'll just show you something else that's we're rolling out at scale, and that is another beacon. So, for time. That thing has a range of about 50 meters. Um, it is, Bluetooth signals are RF signals, so if you get put things in the way, especially water, and people are mostly water, you can block the signal, <coughs> right? But 50 meters generally is a range. This is maybe, maybe half of that, something like that. Too, but it's, it's a dongle, right? It's not that exciting. But, um, it's exciting to us because that thing doesn't interface with the computers at all. You just plug it in and it just uses the USB for power. So we can put these in ATMs because it doesn't interact with the system. It doesn't cause any, any extra uh, complication. Um, so that's the hardware. So how does this all work? So those devices, they're just one-way communication. And you may hear a lot of things like <coughs> tracking and privacy and data and these things are tracking you, the devices themselves don't actually collect any information. You can think of them as Bluetooth light boxes. They're just over and over, they're repeating the same ID over and over, just uh, broadcasting that out. The smarts are all in the phone. So when you have a device that has our software development, like an app with our software development, like Xam, then the phone understands when it sees that beacon, it sees the ID of that beacon, and it says, okay, what, what beacon is that, and should I do anything with that? In the case of Shazam, and, and we, can, we can get into this, but you have to actually take an action as a user. And actually, let me talk about that in a minute. But in general, the phone picks up that beacon signal. It says to the server, am I allowed to see this beacon? Because something that we do that's specific to Gimbal, and it's the reason that banks do deals with us and other uh, security companies, is that we can actually lock down that network. So we can only allow phones that have the keys to those specific beacons, allow them to see the beacons. So you can think of JC and Co has beacons in airports. They want to lease out that network. So they want to say, give access to uh, a Delta app, for instance. And they say, okay, the Delta app can have access to that for the next seven days from midnight to midnight. We program that, pro program that all in our system, and we actually change the codes that come off of these, uh, that, off of the transmission of beacons. So, uh, the, the, short, the short of that is, is that it's a, a digitally secure signal is, is the best way to describe it. So what happens is the phone sees that beacon because you have Bluetooth on it, right? The phone sees that beacon and it says, can I see this beacon? If yes, what action should I take? And again, that could be a pop-up message. It could say, welcome to uh, Marriott Suites, right? Your room is, X, is this number. Feel free to go straight to your suite. Right? And then you use your keyless entry, and now you have a whole new way of, of, uh, of how the guest interacts or doesn't interact with the front desk. Right? Or it could not pick it up. 
push anything. It could just log that you were in the Delta lounges, for instance, or that you were in a sports stadium, and hey, you've been to three sports stadiums in the past month, and you're probably a sports fan. Uh, so all these things happen from the phone to the cloud. We do a lot of things to manage battery. It's probably something that our software engineers spend the majority of the first two years of our company on is figuring out how to use the embedded systems in the phone to not drain the battery and to send data opportunistically, things like that. So that's really where our pedigree comes in and that you know coming out of Qualcomm and having their backing really helps us and access to their technology. So that's one of the things that sets us apart from uh, the other other BP companies. Uh, and I'll I'll talk a little more, a little more about this, but in the case of Shazam, as I said, what happens is the beacon, the, the phone sees the beacon. It understands that it can have access to the beacon because our service says, yes, it's allowed. And what happens in, in, the, in the case of Shazam is that the content is pre-Shazam. So the phone sees the beacon, and now it's ready to go with the content. Right Before, you might have to have it listen to audio, or you might have to hold it up to something for it to visually Shazam. Well, now, just as soon as you get within range of that, it knows you're there, it's just waiting for you to hit the button. So as soon as you hit the button, you get that content. And we're doing a lot of things with, with Shazam. I'll let uh, Sam talk about some of those things. But those are the two types of, of ways that you can interact with people. Uh, I just wanted to touch on really quickly, and these don't speak exactly to the things I wanted to, uh, to, to discuss here, but essentially something can happen when you get within range of a beacon. And I encourage brands and retailers and anybody in you know, sports venues, you don't have to necessarily push a message to somebody as soon as they walk into the venue. We do a lot of things with Madison Square Garden, and you may get something where you walk into uh, a Knicks game, you come in the front entrance, it may give you something like uh, an update to the roster, Carmelo's off the bench of reserve, or they're not giving you a dollar off a hot dog, because we understand, we saw that that game in text messaging, and people are just going to turn it off, right? So it's all about value exchange to the customer. We get involved in some of those conversations with the brands, with the agencies. But uh, there's another concept of just passive listening and understanding better how our users move about uh, the physical world. So you can use that for geofencing. And I, and I should mention that for geofencing, that just uses the location on the phone, the core location. You don't have to have Bluetooth on. If you break a geofence and you don't have Bluetooth on, you still get the message. The beacons, they're, all, they're Bluetooth devices. So something that we did, we've done the last three Super Bowls. So when people come into the fan area, so in, in Phoenix or San Francisco, they would take a whole few city blocks, they would, they would create these environments for people to interact. You would walk into that area, and the phone would tell you, you would trip a geofence, and your phone would tell you, hey, make sure and turn Bluetooth on, because X, Y, Z. That's where the, the value exchange comes in. We're going to tell you who's signing autographs when. We're going to do giveaways, things like that. And then people will come there. Their Bluetooth on. But we've seen really encouraging numbers. Uh, some of our partners have a lot of insight into how many people have Bluetooth on, and especially in cities where you drive, it's it's upwards of 70%, 70 percent, 70 to 80 percent of people have Bluetooth on all the time. Wearable devices, all of those things are going to continue to drive it up. Um, it's it's a yeah, it's more than I would have expected actually. So that's a good sign for for our industry. Uh, and I just wanted to touch on real quickly, I think these devices themselves, this is going to become a commodity, and these are really cheap. These things, uh, the big ones are $30, the small uh, USB ones are, are $25, so we don't make money on the hardware really. We, we make money on managing campaigns and uh, providing a platform to manage all these things. But you can imagine, just you see that how small that dongle is. This technology can go into LED lighting, it can be in any devices that have a minimal amount of power. Bluetooth low energy, that's why we exist. It's because before Bluetooth we chew your battery up, you know, really quickly. So people turn it off. They turn it on, do something and turn it off. Now you can leave it on all the time. It has a very minimal battery impact. But these things are going to be everywhere. And um, really, you know, sky is the limit. We have conversations around what to do with these things. And, um, and again that's why I wanted to, to just kind of burn through this and allow you guys to ask some questions. But uh, I touched on this already. We have a lot of management and analytics. It's usually more data than people can handle, <laughs> even large companies, because you think about the number of sightings that people, as people move about the world, there's a ton of Bluetooth devices there, and there's a ton of geofences. So we manage millions of geofences at this point. 
uh, and that could be around a mall, it could be around a specific store or stadium or a highway, toll booths, it, it, it can be really, really anywhere. So I'm just gonna, whoop, lay animation, <coughs> but just some really quick examples of, of things that we've done. And these will all be, for here should be replaced with things that we know with Shazam because it's really innovative what we're doing with those guys. But uh, Retail Me Not is an app that is a couponing app in the US and people are expecting to get coupons. So we have done campaigns whereby people walk by an out of home advertisement. The Retail Me Not app sees the beacon and at the same time that that person sees the out of home ad, they get an offer in this case it was Levi's, to go into a Levi's store. So we only did it with assets that were within something like 200 meters of the, uh, of the asset, but we got a, an incredible response rate, something like, uh, well, yeah, for this one, it was 12x what they were seeing, but I can tell you that basically uh, a quarter of the people who got that message went to the store, and then, another, oh, I'm sorry, and a quarter percent of, a quarter, 25% of the people who saw that message open that message and read it, and then 20% of those people actually went to the store because we also put people <coughs> in the store. So if you look at that from a uh, you know, native advertising, compared to native advertising campaign, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty good uh, uh, return. And as well, oh, this one, this is a good, uh, another example on the all the way on the other side of the board. We partnered with the Tribeca Film Festival, and uh, so you go in, you watch a movie, there's beacons in the theater, your, the app doesn't bother you when you're in a theater because it understands that you're watching a film. But as soon as you walk out, we have a we see a departure event, and then it just gives you a simple survey question: Did you like the movie or not? Or rate it one to ten. So those types of simple things are I really encourage uh, companies to, to just try to just dip their toe in the water and try different things. <coughs> uh, but that that was a really simple implementation that everybody liked. I'm just click ahead here. That that may be that may be it. Yeah. So. Um, at this point, do you want to do a demo? Uh, mm. I'll speak first, only because if I get it wrong, <laughs> Sam's going to correct me. <laughs> <laughs> um, what Gary said was true, and thanks to Gary. Um, and uh, let me do my plug for Gary first. Gary did our R&D tax credits, BDO did our R&D tax credits, and Gary finally helped us. So any of you that are in, doing research and development, and we're a client of, of Gary's BDO. What we're trying to do, and, and First of all, thank you for Clay from flying over from New York. And as Gary rightly said, this all came about because of Sam's brilliant presentation last month. And it's about bringing together different technologies to create brand new opportunities. So Bob and Simon are here from Eventbrite. We've been working with Eventbrite since 2014. We do events with them all the time. Most of you in this room, I would imagine, are customers or clients of Eventbrite. So it's like taking what Eventbrite do in the real world what we do GenieNet in the virtual world, linking that through to Shazam, and what they can do is Gimbal. So let me give you a couple of examples. These are in discussion, right? These aren't happening, but these are in discussion. Trace is here from Jordan Media. So Jordan look after 120 major retailers in the UK. So with, in discussion with Tracy about a project with New Look potentially. So New Look, if they're launching a new range, can do an event in Oxford Circus. That can be a real live event that Eventbrite can ticket. We link straight into Eventbrite's ticketing system so we can broadcast that virtually. Gimbal can then take care of anything that's going in that store or any other New Look store globally. And not only trigger about purchases, but trigger about the event and those other things that are happening, linking it through to Eventbrite. When the event takes place, and this is the clever bit, is none of us have to hold information about the retail element of it, because that can all be triggered, delivered by Shazam. From a retailer's point of view, and when we say retailer, that could be anything, that could be stadia, that could be events, that could be any type of brand, everybody within that link is creating data. Eventbrite data, Shazam data, GenieNet data, data. So it's not just about the fact that we're taking a consumer base, whether that's an existing consumer base and a new consumer base to take them through to buy something, whether that's a product or a service, <coughs> it's, it's clay right to You're getting all that data as well. So it's, it's very valuable. And then Gary just walked in. Gary is um, Business Development Director at RP2, what used to be Rafa Media. 
This is in discussion. It's not real. But we've been joking about this for a long time. Those of you that are old enough to remember the big breakfast and Paula Yates doing her interviews in a bed, mm -hmm. Gary's, one of Gary's clients is beds and beds. And we've been joking for ages about Cheryl Baker doing in bed with Baker, right? It's just because we know Cheryl and it's just a general discussion. But now, taking Gimbal in the beds and bed stores, Eventbrite doing ticketing both to have a live audience, virtual audience, and then Shazam enable that, so whether you're in the physical location or you're watching remotely, we can then direct you to buy that bed or anything else. Benson want to sell it for that matter. So, <clears throat> as I say, and Gary's got it spot on. I'm irrelevant. I'm irrelevant in this conversation, right? I don't feature on any of these companies' radars. But by putting these businesses together, hopefully there's position for me for delivering one component piece of that, which makes it valuable, not just to me, but hopefully most of the people in the room. I'll now hold it hand over to Sam and he'll tell you all the bits I've got wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there is a cost, which he hasn't told me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Self-deprecation is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Sam Woods from Shazam. Um, I run all our global strategic partnerships. I set up the um, commercial arm of the business uh, with another chap um, outside of America about four years ago. So my background is Channel 4, um, TV, broadcast. They brought me in um, four years ago because uh, the business was pivoting. Um, obviously, traditionally, I, th I think it's probably worthwhile if, if you know, how we've ended up working with Gimbal. <coughs> it's worthwhile giving you the two minute overview of what Shazam is. So, Shazam is um, one of the granddaddies of the tech scene. I'm sorry for anyone who heard this last, last, last month. Um, it was one of the granddaddies of the tech scene in London. Uh, we started about 15 years ago as a music discovery service, text based service. Um, it's going quite right. Uh, it's 2580, you'd hold up your phone and we'd send you a text message saying you were listening to. A rather quote, you would offer you a download of the track. Fast forward to 2008, we were one of the first apps and the first ever iPhone. Uh, we've been growing 4 million downloads a week since then. We've hit uh, 700 million downloads globally. We have 128 million monthly active users. Um, and for, you know, from the commercial perspective, we have a very uh, unique engagement um, mechanism in which if you hear a song, you bother to get your phone out, whether you're in Topshop, you're in the car, you know, we see a lot of Shazam over the month now. Um, <laughs> in the car, um, you know, in front of the telly, which is the normal use behaviour, um, you get your phone, you bother to get your phone out and, <coughs> us, um, and we tell you what you're listening to, what we, what we, what we serve you as a music attack result. That happens 20 million times every day. Just to give you some context, uh, the UK is probably our fourth, fifth biggest market. Um, we see a million Shazams every day. In the so it's a million times people primarily hear some music, get the phone out and do that and we tell them what they're listening to. Now traditionally, our traditional businesses, we drive revenue to um, Apple, Google, to a much lesser extent, um, the Microsoft with their Lumia range, which was not kid. Um, we drive $300 million worth of revenue to those guys every year. So 10% of the world's digital music sales go via Shazam. Um, Good business, um, but as I say, five years ago we realised that the vast majority of our users were Shazam and TV to get music on the telly. They were doing this at the TV, and we, we realised all of a second, why are we just giving people, telling people what music to listen to? Why don't we tell them a bit more about the watching? And we started delivering them, instead of music tag results, branded tag results. We grew a whole business out of that, a very successful business. In the UK, um, most automotive adverts in the, in, in the UK are Shazam labeled, you Shazam a Citroen ad, you Shazam a Fiat ad, a Jeep ad, a Ford ad. You, we, we, we'll deliver you a branded tag result, book a test drive, um, download a brochure, that kind of stuff. We do a lot of it at OTG, movies, games, etc. So we've um, developed a great um, service around that uh, that's uh, being emulated globally. We have um, five offices globally. Um, do really well at that. Um, and obviously the, the natural next step for Shazam was, okay, well we use Shazam Level TV, all those assets are used in cinema, TV, radio, online, so we started Shazam enabling everything. And we're starting to really, you know, from our perspective, connect media plans and drive them to one central location, which would either be a bespoke result that we would create, or we can just link you through to a, an existing mobile URL. Now, the, the next step change for Shazam was a chap called Rich Riley coming into the business. So he's ex Yahoo Europe. He's come in as our CEO and he brought a different mentality into Shazam. Um, all the tech geeks on the second floor of our office in, uh, in Hammersmith, all those tech geeks and all that, about, like that, about our technology. Uh, when Rich came in, he said, 
we need to open up our tech to other to other things. You know, we we, we want to start utilising. We've got a great portal. We've got 128 million monthly active users that we can activate and do different things with. So the first thing we um, diversified into was Visual Shazam, direct competition with Flipper. Um, we have a visual we have a visual recognition element to our app now, so you can. Shazam, so we're doing a lot of smart packaging stuff this, this year with uh, Unilever. Um, you can Shazam Magnum boxes, you can Shazam Cornetto cones, um, Axe links cans, all sorts of things. Um, we're doing a lot in the alcohol sector on that as well, Shazami bottles. Um, that's a really great product. Um, I think, in the most part, uh, our visual recognition piece is best used in things like ticketing. So we're with AG to look at how we can tackle the six billion dollar industry and um, ticket forward. And so using our visual recognition piece to you shazam the ticket, visually shazam the ticket and that verifies it. We can also obviously continue straight to a branding um, piece as well. Um, but the really interesting thing from my perspective and, and, and our, our best innovation to date is you know, working with Gimbal, SDK and Gimbal technology into Shazam. So we can Shazam anything, anywhere. Um, Close touch on this um, previously, but um, what, what, what Gimbal allows us to do is uh, just to give you some real life examples. Um, I'm working with Exterion at the moment, who of course run all the outdoor advertising for their, their own TFL. Um, they run all the buses, um, they also run the West, both Westfields in London. Um, so, initially on the buses, we've Shazam enabled 200 buses using Gimbal beacons. So only 200 out of the 10,000 buses that were operating in London. In the last four weeks, um, we've been running advertising in the interior of the bus, not the exterior. I don't want people running after a bus. <laughs> <laughs> 70 miles an hour. I know, right? Um, not down Oxford Street, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, don't, I don't want people. I don't, um, we, we, we want to get people in a highly, you know, on the board, basically, on a bus. You can Shazam on a bus, and you've got, you know, a long time you're on there to engage your content. So we, our first campaign is with um, Fox, of whom I have a year-long deal with on every release they do. Shazam and every, everything, the TV, the cinema, the radio, online, all that press using our visual stuff. And now we're moving to the, into, into the outdoor, essentially, with Shazam and over buses. We've had 4,000 Shazams over two, uh, on 200 buses in the last four weeks. That's bonkers. Um, you know, it's much harder than our visual um, results, seemingly because it's the it's just using the ordinary user experience of you're on a bus, you see some um, a call to action within the bus thing, um, with, with the three steps saying, say, open, um, turn on Bluetooth, open Shazam, tap to discover, and it's it basically the call to action is um, Shazam to be entertained. It's very vanilla, not, not campaign specific. But even with a kind of vanilla uh, call to action like that, that's not saying Shazam to win a holiday or you know, Shazam to get tickets off. Glastonbury, whatever, you know, put money off your ticket or wherever. It's very vanilla. Um, yeah, 4,000 Shazam, 2,000 people have Shazam. So we're going we're gonna to make that national, hopefully. Um, we've expanded at least to London and then uh, you know, outside into the regions. But um, you know, really, really encouraging results of people Shazamming buses. Now, interesting, what, uh, one of my very smart data people says to me today 4% of those people who Shazam on a bus was their first ever Shazam. Shazam sees four million dollars a week. We don't do it above the line of the you know, marketing. We don't need to. Um, but really interesting that you know that was the first time anyone had Shazam something. Shazam in the bus. <laughs> so, but, you know, this, this is a whole new world. So we're very excited about it. So Claire and I are having lots of conversations with the outdoor providers. So JCB Co. Um, we are going to be Shazam enabling Kingston, all their digital outdoor units in Kingston. That they use as a test bed. Uh, Blue Water as a as a test and. At some point in Q2, Q3, we'll be the Shazam on the Boxer Street. All the digital outdoor, all the uh, side of the all of the side of the um, the digital units on the side of the bus stops, etc. And of course, if you think about these speakers, they've got a radius of 50 meters. So you know, we essentially can Shazam and Avery Boxer Street. It's mad. And you think about Dior, you buy that, um, buy, you know, buy all the digital outdoor uh, in December. Um, Primarily directing people to Selfridges and going by deal um, products to Charlie for a space. Charlie, Charlie's there on space all over it. Um, you know, we can, you can Shazam that unit and then, you know, if you're going the wrong way down Oxford Street, away from Selfridges, we can get you can go right back again. Um, 
lots of interesting stuff. Other, other uses we're exploring right now is in the arena space. Um, you know, two is the obvious one, um, which is the Academy Music Group as well, you know, Shazami in the space. And we've been talking about this uh, this morning with Steve over here about ghosts. So um, I was funny enough, who, who, who first mentioned this to me? I was up at the LG Arena in, in, in Birmingham. They said they had a real problem in that, you know, um, that someone buys four tickets. I've only got data on one person. The other four people are, are ghosts to them. And if we can get people to shoot Shazam in the environment, you know, we have their user ID. Uh, we can deliver them an experience, you know, we can get them, get them back, backstage or actually we came up with a solution, perhaps we could use Pogo Seat to get a seat upgrade if they, if they wanted to at the arena, perhaps. Um, but more importantly to me is I've got their user ID. So say you've Shazammed um, the Kung Fu Panda campaign on a bus, or you're at, um, you know, you're at a Dell at the O2, you Shazam, I know you're at the O2 at that time, it's time stamp, you've got your user ID, I can then create a user bucket and then retarget those people on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, mobile networks. We're doing this with a number of our clients right now, um, and the click-through rates we see on the stuff we post on their behalf on these on these social networking sites, uh, somewhere in the region, well, between two to ten percent click-through rate. As you know, anything about mobile click-through rates are number about point four. So it's, uh, it's it's bananas the kind of engagement we see, and the retargeting piece that we can uh, that we can activate off the back of this. So. Yes, it's exciting times. Um, if you turn Bluetooth on now, um, I used to have, you know, and Shazam, I used to have this set up to my LinkedIn to be cool. I was actually just with Amex. We're going to, we're going to look at uh, Shazam enabling Somerset House or the um, Somerset House series. So um, if you Shazam now, uh, you'll go through to an Amex site with Bluetooth on. Um, yeah, and you can see it just, this is just delivering you straight to a mobile URL. Knowing that it's not a great, it's not a, it's not a great um, experience because it's a, not a, it's not a mobile enabled site. I need to have a word with Amex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the right. I'm on the right. Yeah, for, uh, I mean, for me, you know, uh, Gimbal working with Gimbal just opens up a funnel of access points that we can get people to engage at. So, Steve mentioned hypothetically, say we could. Uh, Shazam enable, Gimbal enable, um, a new look store. You can get everyone going to the store, encouraging them through Shazam. That means you know I've got everyone who bought something, or everyone who didn't buy something, but everyone in store. We can put them into a pot, and then we can we, then we can say say new look put on an event. Um, I can have a direct conversation with those people though, because I know they've been in store. Um, also, you know, when, when they've Shazammed in store, they can come to an, ex an experience. You can say, well, okay, do you want to watch the new little catwalk show that's happening in September? Add to calendar. Um, and then as that comes, you know, as, 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 you, as that event comes up, your, your, um, your, your calendar pops up. It's got a the URL in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, how much was it? I couldn't remember. <laughs> Execution. There's all, I mean, there's yeah. all sorts we can do. Um, you know, we, and so, just on the point of sale, so if you're in a store, yeah. um, we talked about Benson for Beds earlier or New Look. Um, I'm guessing t when you're the point of sale, you, you put the matrix onto the poster itself, do you the points, you register it onto the Shazam system. Or just, can you just elaborate how that works? Can we take a picture? On the visual stuff. Okay, so on the visual. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll talk about our whole business because it's a really good point. So um, Shazam is all about proactive engagement. We don't we don't um, push. It's all about doing you know bothering to do this and seeing you know, a new look logo, uh, a, a kung fu panda film that you want to engage with, engaging. So um, in all our activations, what we include is a Shazam call to action saying Shazam now to go for test drive. Shazam now to uh, as we've. Uh, Magdalen this uh, across Europe release the beast on their, on their new prize card. Uh, and what we do so on television, as you're probably all aware, we put the logo in the bottom left hand corner that um, we would effectively audio on the ad. With visual, what we do, there are a couple of solutions. Um, so for packaging and for press, what we do is we invisibly watermark um, the, the, either the packaging or, or the press ad, and that um, using a couple called Digimark. So when you Shazam it, just open the tap the camera on Shazam, Shazam it, and um, we'll send you through to the, to the branded tag results. Um, we can do uh, um, bigger solutions where we ingest the picture.
future. Um, so uh, this is, I'm doing this with Diabolic at the moment, who, who run all the outdoor advertising for um, labels. So you Shazam and Adele post up <coughs> vision Shazam, and you can do that from a much bigger distance. To be honest, the better solution if you want to Shazam at distance is using gimbal uh, and using beacons. Because you know, you're not, you're not have, well, one, you're not having to use a new user behavior, um, you're just using the normal the big button bang and taking it through to the same to the same site. I think for, for me, visual visual Shazam, this is why Unilever so on it, is just smart packaging and um, actually making them more of traditional um, traditional media such as press as well. So um, making your press got harder for you as well. <coughs> What's that? Then is Shazam, yes. What's that? So the yeah, express? So the easy set up here. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Because you guys saw that it was listening for music at the same time, so there's not. Absolutely. So in the case of festivals, for example, it's an interesting one. Say you're at, um, you know, you're watching your favourite DJ. At the same time, we've got background listening. So you know, say say you are in an environment, or you know, say Topshop, for example. I've been talking to those guys for a long time, an arcade group in general. Where you know, in in store, we see. I can actually tell you. Who she's only what anywhere, very to a hyper local level. So, say for example, Topshop, we get a lot of Shazams in Topshop. You know, they're 16, 25 female audience going around, and they've got they work with um, who's the old radio one DJ? I his name. Uh, Bruno Brooks. Bruno Brooks. Yeah, so he, he, he runs a um, he, run, he runs an in-store music company. Um, so we see a lot of Shazams in store anyway. Um, so you know, beacon enabling that, I can tell them what they're listening to absolutely, but also I can give them you know, a top shop, a top shop uh, tag result um, that will then allows them to well, one we're working with R R Donnelly for example with Shop Direct. Um, so if you say you're in store and I can tell anyone who's been in store and not bought something, perhaps you can have retarget them. This is what R R Donnelly is doing. So anyone who's gone to Berry.com um, and you know, puts them in the basket and not bought it, they're sending out visually enabled letters for anyone who's done that, so you can scan the letter and get 10% off you know, to purchase this and incentivize them, stuff like that. Um, yeah, all sorts. And if, you know, for me, it's, uh, okay, I can have caught, captured everyone shazamming in Topshop, I've got a lovely user segment that I can um, then retarget across other mediums, have an ongoing conversation. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? I have a question about the festival thing. Um, so using Gimbal and, and Shazam, I'm just going to use the Amsterdam dance event as an example. So if you've got a city like Amsterdam and it's split between north, south, east and west, and, and there's a conference that's going on for a whole week, and let's say drum and bass music is in the north part of the city, techno is in the west part of the city, house music is in the south part of the city, and the conference is in the east part of the city. If you were Gimbal and Shazam enabled in Amsterdam, you, um, the customer, the consumers, would be walking through, would, would walk through ring fences, right, in those different areas, north, south, east, and west, and would be then guided to the techno section or the, or the conference section, depending on what part of the city they were standing in, like your fan fan zones at at, at Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, sure, and I, and I can say specifically, so there's a lot of companies that are trying to do wayfinding, uh, which we put under that umbrella, and that could be indoor or outdoor. Uh, it's it's tougher with beacons, you, so you certainly can do it if you have a density of geofences and beacons, but essentially uh, the beacons understand how far you are away from that that thing. It doesn't know what direction you are, whether you're north, south, or, or what, what have you. It does know that uh, if it picks you up in, in three sequential beacons, you're going this direction, and it can tell you to keep doing that or go the other way. And in fact, there's a, there's a couple companies that are doing uh, wayfinding for visually impaired. And, uh, and so they do it underground. And then you have different things, like the content has to be cached because you're underground. But that's neither here nor there. But yeah, it's, it's possible. I don't know how practical, though, it would be in, in that application. It would probably be more from a macro level giving them understanding where they are and zooming them out up to, to, to show them the way rather than saying go this way or that way, like navigation. Right. right. Are your beacons mobile? 
Well, one is we're, we're looking at launching next year a new motor racing series. So we have different tracks around the world. Oh, yeah. So if we want to get that system in, could we take it with us to South Africa, take it to Malaysia, and just use that same system? Because obviously it's us that wants the data, or direct people. So can we add that package and take it, yeah, sure. take it with us? As well? We developed a very space age um, device. It's double sided sticky tape from 3M. <laughs> 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 yeah, we, we ship we them along with the beacons. So yeah, you can just pull the things off. So just, just, just on that, um, Shazam uh, got offered sponsorship of uh, Mana Racing Team on the Indian one. They gave us free, so they didn't do that. Yeah, but you know, the, the, the two Mana drivers, they walk around with beacons in their pockets. Shazam made one of them. And you know they are Shazamable as such. So yeah. How I, th I think you suggested from a openness point of view. Obviously, you can integrate the gimbal stuff into sort of if, if a brand's got a current app. How where, where's the Shazam situation with like an API of integrating into third party apps? Is it very much still driven by the? Yeah, we don't do it currently. Yeah. We don't do it currently. Sure. Sorry, how does it work in South by Southwest, for example, on a on a standard festival site with multiple stages? Yeah, they use it a lot of different ways. So one way is that uh, when an act finishes, you can you'll get a pop up for whatever's happening next in that, in that festival. It's probably actually more applicable to meeting rooms and, and uh, uh, stages where speakers are going because you sit the, it, the room clears out and then everybody has to pull out their their match. So it'll tell you what's coming up next. Um, it will also trigger actual alerts on their marquee sponsors, if you get near one of their tents or one of their areas, it will give you tips. Um, I think they used it, I didn't get to, get to go this year, I was traveling elsewhere, but I think they used it for line busting, which is something we do at the US Open. You get off of the train and then it tells you what entrance to go to because it, it detects how many phones are in that area. <laughs> I, I think they did that, if, if not, they talked about it. <laughs> sorry, um, just, sorry, Jeremy. I want to ask about the uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, what piece is needed? So, for example, the, uh, if the, you put such kind of small dongle to the, uh, your laptop, mm -hmm. and then the, uh, you can start the testing this kind of audience. If you have a kind of yeah, so the way we do that is we have we have two free applications. They're in the App Store. Uh, the one that you probably want is called Hello Kimball, and it just allows you to buy a beacon and then start triggering messages messages off of it. So we also have another app that we measure the strength of the of the signal, things like that. But yeah, out of the box you can buy a beacon and start. So you, yeah, you put the you a uh, vehicle to the other side. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. And absolutely. then you can uh, uh, Yeah, you got a pop up message from Hello Gimbal and you decide what that message says because you own now you own that beacon network, <laughs> even though it's one beacon. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, emitting the some signal and the, uh, it's uh, received by the owner of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy. I'm right in saying that in order to get these messages back from the beacon, you've got to have an app open on your phone. No. So this is where, uh, so our SDK can wake up apps from being hard closed in the background. And part of the way we do that is that your phone, if you have Bluetooth on, your phone is always listening for Bluetooth. So not to get to the weeds, but we use the Bluetooth ranging on the phone to detect things that are around that are Bluetooth. So if there's something that's gimbal enabled, we can wake that app up and have it actually pop up something, even if you haven't used it. So it becomes about a business decision, not a logistical decision. All you have to do is have Bluetooth on. So let's say I want to put a beacon in Heathrow Airport, yeah. okay? And everybody that's going to walk through is going to get a message that I want them to see. If you control that app and you want to trigger a message off of that beacon and send it to every single person, then yeah, that will happen. What do I need to do to be able to do that? So you need the beacons. You probably need approval from the airport to put the beacons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. And if you have like, like we've run into this before, like you have a vending machine, but it's inside of a Tesco or whatever. 
and you put it in there, who owns like who owns the air rights, right? Is what this is getting to. Who owns space? Um, but uh, you need the beacons, the physical beacons, and you need our platform that we license on SaaS basis. And if you put your S our SDK is free, you put it into your your app, and then we price the platform based on number of users or number of locations. Or in the case of Shazam, we just do sometimes we just do revenue split. So, so I can load my own product, I can get other people to actually see, get an advert up on their phone or some message on their phone. If you control them. that app. So yes. you always have to have an app. Yeah, and, and actually it's important to mention, so you guys will start hear, hearing about Eddie Stone and other things like that. Eddie Stone allows you to send a URL to an Android phone through Chrome, and you don't have to have an app. It's great. Um, it, as long as you have an Android phone and have all these things right stepped together. So we're a partner with Google as well, so we, we work with them on any stone. But, but for the most part, for all intents and purposes, you really you need an app to activate those things. Can I ask on that note with the app? Yeah. I up and switch off notifications. So yeah. you mentioned the dormant app. Would it force open the app and force open the notifications yeah. as well, though? No, you so it does rely on the user having the app installed and notifications turned on. So when you say the app, which app are you talking about? She said, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we have a uh, software development kit that has to be integrated into your, your app so that it can see the beacons. So we've done that with you know thousands of apps, and there's other apps that we're trying to get. So, so my app would actually be open on somebody's device? It would have to be open, but you need to have our software Embedded in it. Embedded in so we've got a little two two megabyte uh, file that gets integrated into the guts of your app, and that's the thing that recognizes the beacons and geofences and talks to the platform. How much are you paying to have your technology in our app? See me after. But that's the joy of working with Shazam, because that, that's, that's right. the whole idea of it. Is is as we all know, getting people to download apps is bloody difficult. When you've got 700 million people already got on their phone, for those of you that own arenas or shopping centres or look after brands, yeah, okay, it's not your <coughs> app, but who cares? It yeah. is a shit. This is about selling shit. That's the great thing about it. So as long as I can communicate with the customer base with my website so they can buy something, I don't care how that's triggered. It makes no odds to me. And yeah, okay, I've got to pay for the privilege, but what they're charging to get that engagement, you will know what your return on investment's going to be immediately. And it's not just you're taking money, you're getting all the data as well. So that's why this is, to me, matter from heaven in terms of, like I was saying before, about event bright for your event and at us, for virtual and then bringing that together, it's out, an out of the box solution. You know, and, and there's very few businesses that you can work with that between them have got a billion customers. I mean, what else do I need to say? It's, you know, to me, it's a given, really. And yeah, of course, there's a cost, but you're paying for the cost of all their development, all of that work, and in a strange sort of way, the fact that they're we're all able to work together because you know whether it's New Look or whether it's Benson Beds or any 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 global business. When you walk in and you've got the power of those three, mm. that's a re very, very powerful argument about how you can immediately trigger it. You haven't really got to do much, because as long as you've got the space, and because of the outdoor stuff they're doing, and where Gimbal are working indoors, and because of the power of the i have got, it's simple. It is to me. I mean, I'm, I'm simple, as you all know. So, and if I get it, then all the people you work with are going to get it. So, <laughs> so Gary. The real, the real question there is how much is a beacon? So, oh, you missed that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 So, 30 quid, yeah? Yeah, until that point, the hardware is, is nominal. No, no, 10 to 50. 50. Yeah. <laughs> and on the volume deal, if you want to buy you know, 500 of them. Yeah, that is 30, you know, for 30 <laughs> <laughs> what, what we want, we really would like to, Sam and I have been talking about this, so that it devils in the details, I guess, but we'd love to put together some packages that are just preset. You get a certain number of beacons, you get to Shazam your stuff, and then see, see where it goes. I think, I think the thing we have to highlight here is I'm not sending you to a Shazam mode property, I'm sending you straight to your URL. Mm. So Shazam's just the access point. Yeah. And then it goes straight to your right, room. even later than Gary arriving. No, 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 no,
Now, obviously, you know, when you're talking about arenas, that's a place, a, a, you know, a Westfield mouth, that's a place. So we're business to attraction designers. So give an example, there's a 23 million community under the Biaza banner, mm. as opposed to a London zoo, yep. you know, which is one point something or whatever. Yep. So just in terms of efficiency of getting, if you like, this sort of model into a new a business community, or a visitor community, or a user community, it could well be better, Steve, mm. and you know this. Can I just say this? Although you came late, that's a blood good question. Yeah. <laughs> But in terms of accessing the industry, mm. it's not the actual uh, attraction, yeah. it's actually Biaza, mm. Balpa, or Alba. Yeah. Now that's a much but easier, uh, short, connected, efficient way of actually bringing. Yeah. And then of course, as you say, the, the prices can come down, and therefore... Yeah, but that's a great question, funny enough. It's a brilliant question because of something they both said earlier. Because you control the environment, so as BRs and members or Balfour members, yeah. we control that environment and we know what our footfall is, yeah. we can then resell that to the advertisers and to the people who want to promote to that family audience. Very powerful. And I can do one better for you than the Beacons. We actually license out our firmware so you can put it into any devices. For instance, Run is wireless, we put them in their access points. Yeah. It's going to go out of bunch of stuff. That's quite interesting because you guys are on the, the Communication Development Committee, as you know, Steve, I think that's a good place, didn't I? You did that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank badly. You, thank, thank you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that there is a really efficient way of actually uh, hitting a massive community. Mm. And it isn't just then about, if like, the retail, uh, well, the financial currency, but mission currency, mm. you know, which is really interesting mm. in terms of some of these actually attractions. You know, it's, it's just a, another filter, another tier, which is really interesting. Yeah, and well, well, I was going to say, we, the, all of the phone booths in New York City are becoming Wi-Fi kiosks. You guys have seen these things, they're massive. It was Titan Advertising that owned all the phone booths, which didn't work, but they kept them there because the advertising was massive. Uh, so Google bought Titan, and they bought another uh, hardware engineering uh, company called Control Group, merged them, called it Intersection. So they're replacing all these phone booths, and, and to your point, you know, uh, the company that makes all these devices, we just... Uh, we go through them and they put the Bluetooth devices in there. So now there's going to be these Bluetooth devices on every street corner in York where there was a phone booth. So what you're saying is they can take the phone booth, they can wrap it <coughs> saying switch your Bluetooth on to get X, Y, and Z. So that over here, BT was selling wraps around phone boxes and they had a, they actually had a broadband <coughs> in it. minute. You know, it was a touch screen thing, which was like now, if you think back, it's prehistoric. But they were doing that and it failed. They couldn't get the estate working. Well, but now they, they could do it. So yeah, they they and they did wrap wrap them with the ads, but they're actually replacing the whole units, and it's a you know three meter tall screen big device, and it has a digital screen on yeah. it. It's not touch screen yet, but it, you know we're gonna get to the point where and, and everybody loves to use uh, Minority Report as the advertising <laughs> uh, <laughs> example, but basically your phone knows that you're close to that. So wouldn't it be interesting that it changed to a, a specific sports team ad? when you got close to it. That will happen, that's pretty easy actually. Mm. There's just not scale enough for media companies to buy or for teams to do that. Uh, we're going to be moving next door. Go on, Sorry. Yeah, just, just a bit about the proximity on the beacons. Um, so you said they have a 50 meter range. Yeah. What if I've got a smaller retail space and I've got men's wear, women's wear, and I wanted to direct them to specific parts of my site or specific ads, are they going to clash? Or can you turn them down? Or can you get clever? So the way that we built the system is that you just put the beacons up, right? Because we got to get we have a partnership with uh, like a large coffee chain, so they got to get 10,000 out, and they're just sending them out to these stores. And so those associates, all they have to do is stick it on the wall. We manage everything in the platform, so you actually set up. We call them places, and and you can set up even just using one beacon, you can set up concentric circles so that these things are really sensitive. You can make them work just like NFC if you want to. So they're sensitive to the point to the point of inches. It's harder to tell if somebody's 30 feet versus 20. Five feet away, that, that gets more difficult, but we can definitely tell 12 inches versus two inches. Sorry, keep using these. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, the, the answer is managing the platform. <laughs> but in something like a, a re, a, let's say a, a, a shopping center, sort of more support situation where the communal sort of space is owned by the asset owner, and then you've got, in effect, your retailers who've got their own parameters. Can you actually define, similar to you said on your map, by drawing around and saying it doesn't spill out into the communal areas? It will, especially if you use geofencing, it will, it will spill. Um, 
you can use you can set beacons such inside the retail store that it can reach just to the entrance. If you really wanted to do that, you could do that. But this is a conversation we have a lot. At airports, we have it a lot. Um, malls, especially. But anywhere where there is the, the <coughs> signal is going to bleed onto something else that's either communal or they, they call it their common space, whatever. So, yeah, it's case by case. But it is manageable in terms of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's configurable. Thanks, Cool. The uh, local computer, which has got to be a dongle, mm -hmm. is a community, communicating with servers. And how do you know? No, no, no. no. The, the, the beacons communicate with the phone. Yeah, but the uh, sub, a local computer yeah. is accessing it through your computer. No. 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 So the, so the, the USB space. one is only for power. It doesn't interface with the computer. It only sends a Bluetooth signal right. that goes to the phone. The phone goes up to the server. But the uh, controlling software. Is it locally? No, no local, no local software at all. There's only SDK on the phones. Software development yeah. kit inside the app is the only local software. Only local software. Only local so software. The, Everything else is server side. Uh, Everything else is server side. Yeah. Server side. So the uh, server and the uh, <coughs> local computer is communicating. No. Uh, your company. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the short answer is probably not. Probably not. If you put the dongle in a computer or yeah. whatever. It's just communicating with the phone, uh, and the phone communicates with the server. So the computers don't come into into play at all, unless there's something the server is communicating with the computer for some reason, it's retargeting or something. So you go into a movie theater, you see a movie, you see a beacon, and then you go and you're you're browsing BBC, you get an ad for a movie. You're getting an ad for the movie because you were in a movie theater. That's not happening necessarily on scale today, but it will happen. But the short answer is no, the computer is not interacting at all. Right. We're going to move next door and have coffee. There's just a few things I need to say. Before. Again, we were talking hypothetically before, but I'm very proud today because after two and a half years of work, as we're standing here, the BBC are at our Big Cat Sanctuary doing the first day of 100 days filming what's well, going to be four one-hour documentary programs for BBC One next year. We have put into the contract, they haven't signed the contract yet, we put into the contract with the BBC that our staff are Shazam enabled. Because that means that as that goes out globally through BBC Worldwide, so we're pretty confident it's going to 150 countries, people will be able to Shazam enable that broadcast. So that it's actually integrated, and we actually put it into the contract so there's no argument about whether that happens. So it's interesting because that's been an interesting conversation about whether it's even doable, and then, but at the moment, they've not reacted to that, they've, they've reacted to a couple of other things. So as you can imagine, there's quite a few entrepreneurial things in that contract. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, that'd be cool, yeah. yeah. We've got the other thing say that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so they're putting them in the pocket. Um, two other very quick things. One, um, the first event that Gary kindly hosted was with a company called Zoomobby that are based in Leeds. Um, they've got really clever technology that can track video content where it goes in the world. They're part of Leeds Digital Festival that's at the end of the month and we're presenting at that festival and broadcasting from the festival. Um, so we'll send you some information about that in case there's any useful, any use to you. And on the 29th of April, Gary's kindly given us another day and we've got James Edder here. If you haven't met James, you need to come meet James. He is probably one of the most dynamic young entrepreneurs, not just in this country, globally. He's up student beings when he was at uni. Um, he's now got a new business called Causa, which is like location-based LinkedIn. Really clever. I'm not going to steal any thunder. Just come on the 29th of April, it's a Friday thing, because trust me, it'd be worth your while, because it's just worth having James in your contact book, if nothing else. Thank you to Garen, thank you to Clay for finding from New York, again thank you to Sam, thank you to everybody for taking time out of your busy day, enjoy the coffee, and we will talk to you later. Thank you very much.